Welcome to the Talk Tennis Podcast. Today, I am joined by two representatives of the USTA Southern section. Ted Reese, you do a ton of amazing things for the USTA and specifically the Southern section. And Kelly Hesketh, you also are a key member on the USTA Southern staff. So I wanted you guys to introduce yourselves since you obviously both juggle a lot of different hats and are doing a lot of different things. So Kelly, let's start with you. Ladies first. Sure. So um, I started my tennis, I guess you could say career or life in Atlanta, Georgia, when I um, just had my second daughter. Um, I have two daughters. Um, I was 32, picked up a tennis racket and went up to the neighborhood courts with a teaching pro at nine o'clock at night with a bunch of ladies in my neighborhood, put the kids to bed, headed up to the tennis court, and we learned the game of tennis. And from there, um, it has just transpired into a lifelong career. Um, like I said, I have two daughters. One played at the collegiate level and the other came through um, juniors playing junior team tennis. So a little bit of a different path for her. But uh, I learned the game through their, um, you know, them learning the game as well. And um, when, when my daughter got really involved with um, competition. I started volunteering for lots of different um, things within the USTA. Mm -hmm. Um, I was on the South Carolina board of directors, then became a tennis official. And then I started teaching some on the neighborhood courts. And then I started uh, a career with USTA Southern as a tennis service representative. So um, it's, I've, like you said, I've had um, my hands in a lot of different aspects of tennis. And it really has just become um, family, friends, fun, and fitness for, for all of us. So Awesome. I love that. That's so fun to hear. Ted, what about you? I know you also have a lot of things that you are in charge of and passion projects that you're working on. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, for having us. It's great to be here with you. And thanks for all the support from Tennis Warehouse. And great to be on with Kelly. Yeah, I have kind of that uh, different background, especially to being a teaching pro. I grew up in a small town in eastern North Carolina and uh, really didn't have access to tennis. I could have probably never played given on uh, economic uh, in the area as well as how tennis was. And uh, it, it was only at a country club. But I grew up playing all the free sports, baseball, basketball and football, and uh, knew that I wanted to major in engineering. So when I was being recruited, I I uh, looked for an engineering school and went to NC State in Raleigh, majored in electrical engineering and played baseball. And uh, fast forward a little bit, was got out of school, moved to Cary and was uh, working in engineering and the neighborhood had courts in, uh, in our area. So a uh, girl I was dating dragged me out on the courts and a friend of mine played tennis. And the next thing you knew, I was hooked and was playing all the time. And within a year was... Uh, doing lots of different tennis things and still working in engineering, but was actually playing some pro tournaments with some of the guys in the area a year later and just uh, kept playing, ended up uh, starting a company and using my engineering designing tennis facilities and then ended up building some that I owned and managed myself and have continued keeping my hand in that as well as some other activities through the companies I own. But on the volunteer side, I've loved coaching. Uh, even at my clubs, I got very involved in high performance coaching, had uh, 15 or 20 kids that were top 10 in the nation and coached uh, everything from tiny tots all the way to kids playing at the U.S. Open. So wow. it's just been an incredible journey. Tennis has meant a lot to me and uh, and all the people, the people in tennis are really are what have kept me involved. And I volunteered at every level from local to the state, to the section, and now nationally and serve on the Southern Board of Directors as a vice president, as well as chairing a national committee. So um, I've, I've had the chance to be involved in all different levels, and it's really just had a huge impact on, on what I've done in my life. Wow, you guys, that's awesome. I love hearing the passion for tennis. And you can tell that you guys are, you fit in really well with your community as well as you find a family atmosphere, which is so key when we love what we do. You know, it's it's so easy to keep coming back every day. Um, something that you both brought up that I thought was interesting and relevant right now is that neither of you really grew up in tennis, which for me, that's kind of my background, grew up in tennis. But within the past couple of years with the pandemic, we're seeing a lot of players 
later in life, either come to tennis or come back to tennis. Maybe they played in high school or whatnot. So I think your experiences in that regard are super valuable as we see our sport growing all of a sudden, which is great. Um, have you guys noticed a big jump in tennis players in the Southern spe- section specifically? So in South Carolina, we have had a huge uh, increase in new players. And in response, we have create a lot of programming to keep those players, um, whether they're beginners or, you know, come like you said, coming back to the sport. We've created a lot of uh, beginner leagues and tennis 101 programs to, to capture those players, get them out on the court and, and find creative ways as well to keep them engaged. So, yeah, we have seen an influx of uh, tennis players in South Carolina for sure. Well, and Ted, maybe you can help answer this question for our listeners. We have a lot of listeners that are like super into tennis. They play on five USGA leagues and whatnot, but we also um, are experiencing players that are kind of, like I said, newer to the sport and trying to learn more about the sport. So we also have international listeners. Can you guys, or Ted, can you let me know exactly what the USTA does for someone who might not be a USTA member? Why is it important to kind of check out what the USTA is offer, offering and what does a USTA membership all include? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think the pandemic was so hard and still is in so many ways, but, um, you know, it allowed us to really reach out and touch our tennis community and do things such as we did, we had a CARES program for tennis facilities and tennis pros because a lot of them weren't on the court. But what we found out, too, after supporting them, and that was one of the passion projects you talk about, we got to put about a million dollars out in the hands of our Southern pros and facilities. But then as soon as they could come back, they were just dying to get back out on the court, and they were seeing all these new players coming. And so that's for USTA programs, but also just local programs. And really, USTA is about helping organize, but it's about tennis. It's not about USTA tennis. It's how can we get a a racket in kids' hands? How can we get ladies out on the court that have never played? How can we get old athletes that were men that played other sports to try it? And the pandemic kind of pushed them into there because the, the social distancing was built in. And it's very inexpensive. You need a few balls and a racket. And really, I think it's, you know, 75, 80% of tennis is at public parks. So it's not expensive to get into. But with the USTA, we try to provide a lot of programming to give you alternatives. So league play to help you connect with other people. There's some great programs throughout our southern section, which is nine states. Everybody's got some different names, but things like Try Tennis, which is really to get people that have never played off the couch and get them to say, hey, maybe I can try this. Maybe this is hard. So it's meant to instruct them in such a way that it's really quick. And at the end of three or four weeks, they're out there playing matches. They're not just hitting balls. They're not just taking lessons because the fun is in playing and the social and getting to meet your friends and playing doubles and those kind of things. And then for kids, just all kinds of programs, they're out there with their parents, just trying to get things uh, that allow those kids to get out there and try it. So try tennis for kids. But junior circuit events, which are just a first touch, kind of a toe in the water for competition and just making it fun so that they don't feel like they're out there playing at the U.S. Open and it's cutthroat competition, but they're out there playing with people at the like ability levels and team challenges. So really, the USDA is really about trying to use the resources to bring people into the game and like with the Southern Cares to help those that are already in the game. And then I've even heard of a program that's uh, here locally that's called Rusty Rackets. And that's for people that put their rackets down maybe when they had kids or they got that second job and didn't have a chance to play. But maybe now they're thinking, wow, I need some exercise. The pandemic's not allowed me to go to the health club or do these other things. And so this is a program that's getting those people that had played to dust off those rackets, get them out of the corner, come out and meet some other people and get involved. So, you know, the USDA is really about trying to get everybody to have a chance to play everything from kids to adults. But then we've got all the at-risk groups that we want everybody to have that chance to play tennis. I would have loved to have had that opportunity as a kid. So working with these at-risk groups with uh, NJTLs, which were started by Arthur Ashe, uh, a huge name in tennis and what a, you know, what a great tennis player, but an even better person. So Arthur was involved with uh, a couple of other guys in starting this National Junior Tennis League that's now called National Junior Tennis and Learning. So it's combining education, 
with tennis and it's in these at-risk communities, these underserved communities, and it gets kids on the court. They are exposed to tennis, they're exposed to academics and STEM learning, but it's combining all that together and with friends that are going to know about tennis. So, you know, that's really what I, I guess we really want USTA to not stand for the letters, but to stand just for tennis and trying to provide lots of opportunities and meet you wherever you are in your community. Nice. I love that. Um, I wanted to back up as well. Can you tell me who all is included in the Southern section? Because I'm a SoCal girl, so I'm SCTA. And I just remember like always at Zonals, it was like, oh, the Southern section. Like you guys are always bringing the, the strong players, but it's like a big group. You guys have, uh, you cover, I think you said nine states. Who all is included? So, so yeah, we um, include nine states in the Southern section from Kentucky, uh, down through the Carolinas, Tennessee, Kentucky, or uh, uh, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, uh, Mississippi, <laughs> Louisiana. So yeah, the, we're we're a, a very big section, um, and I personally am the TSR in South Carolina. So each each state uh, has um, a TSR, and Georgia actually has three TSRs. So um, yeah, so there are eleven TSRs around the, the southern section. And we have, I think, uh, over 25% of the USTA membership living in these nine southern states. So as Kelly said, she she serves South Carolina. I live in North Carolina, but the, the southern board that I serve on is those nine states. So um, we've got a diverse population, but we've been very lucky through the pandemic that we've not been maybe as dramatically affected. We've been able to get back out because you can play outdoors 10 or 12 months of the year, depending on what part of our section you're in. But you're right. There, there's always been great junior tennis. And uh, with my high performance background, boy, it was great to go to nationals. and know you were going to see a lot of kids and parents from the southern section there playing, whether the term was in SoCal or up north or uh, maybe down in Florida. So it's always been a very active section as well. And because of that, I think uh, have tried to put a lot of resources back in the game. So we like to think that it's a strong section, but really there's just great tennis throughout our nation and we're just one part of that. But having the the resources of being uh, that many uh, members lets us do a lot of things, but yet we've got a lot of diverse areas just within uh, those nine states. Yeah, and it's also, you guys are in an area where there's a lot of college teams and a lot of good college tennis. So I kind of love the idea of like starting someone that maybe tennis was never available to them and then to be able to do an NJTL program. And then maybe on a weekend, they could go watch a college match or, you know, tune in to a, a professional player that's from the Southern section or even just watch a junior tournament. So it's kind of cool. And then think that they can progress all the way as an adult and still be involved in playing and all of that. So that's that's kind of a fun idea. <laughs> well, you speak about the college kids, and I think one of the programs that, and, and Kelly can speak to this as well, but it's just really, really awesome. Last weekend in uh, Cary, North Carolina, the Tennis on Campus uh, Fall Invitational Championships were there, and there were teams from all over, from Arizona to up in New York to Michigan, and just tons of college kids. And these are kids that aren't playing on varsity programs, Maybe uh, I've got two boys that play at a pretty high level, one in college, one in high school. And a lot of these kids could go play Division I, Division II tennis somewhere, but maybe they want a specific academic program. Or in, in my son's uh, thing, he, he had a specific school, and they're a top 10, top 15 program. So whether you could be a walk-on on that team and maybe never play, but now with tennis on campus, you're seeing incredible tennis. I mean, these kids look like they're Division I players but they have so much fun. It's not the same pressure. They're traveling with their teammates. They're going bowling between matches. They're going out to dinner. They're dancing. There's music. So that's incredible. But then you go on up to the varsity and the area I live in, we have NC State, University of North Carolina, and Duke all within 30 minutes of where I live and the tennis facility where we hold an event. And we started a pro event, but we support all three of those schools with wild cards. So we get to bring in those players to see what pro tennis is like, even at the Division I collegiate level, to give them aspirational value of what they might want to do later on in their life. And so it's so neat that now we've got programs from that, like, you know, cradle to grave that they can start out and try tennis kids. <laughs> they can play an adult league, but they can go through and play in college, even if they don't want to be a serious player at a varsity level. 
but boy, they have so much more fun, I think. And then those are a lot of the lifelong players that are going to continue to play league tennis, want to have their kids involved. So I think you're right. I think having the collegiate programs to be aspirational, but then tennis on campus just fills a huge niche. I think at NC State this past year, they had 250 kids try out for their club program. And that's just phenomenal to know that there's that much interest on a campus. So I hope we'll see those programs try to grow a little bit after the pandemic so that we're giving an option to everybody to stay involved with the racket in their hands, no matter what their level. Wow, that's amazing. And now that you're like mentioning all these schools, uh, Tennis Warehouse sponsors a couple pro players. And there's definitely a few that have come out of the Southern section, have also coached in the Southern section and are now coaching college in the Southern section. The one that comes to mind, just because I think she's an absolute rock star, is Haley Carter. Um, she is now at Vanderbilt coaching, but like just kind of left behind her top 25 WTA doubles ranking career to go back to coach. And I'm thinking just of her as a person. And I would like to think that this is some of some of the Southern section values rubbing off, but she's always so aware and cognizant about giving back to the community. And it seems like Maybe it's just the Southern charm you guys have, but like that seems like it's such an important value to the Southern section. So just a little uh, tidbit of info with Haley. My daughter actually played her when Haley was seven years old. No way. My daughter daughter was 10 years old. So we go way back. (laughs) (laughs) You know Haley. Okay. Yeah, she's a a great competitor and uh, just an all around good person. And she, she played at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, just right down the road. And uh, their coach, Brian Calvis, is, is a great guy. Uh, his, his son actually played on the high school state champion with, with my son. But uh, Brian is a great coach, and he instills a lot of that in, in his team. But Haley's just an excellent person. What a great doubles player. But just like you said, just a great, a great advocate for tennis, um, just an ambassador. So to have her coaching and really touching these kids and helping mold them, because, you know, 95% of these kids are not going to play pro tennis. So she can talk about that because she played a little pro, but she can also talk about the aspirational value of what you're going to do outside of tennis. And I think that's where she's going to have great impact on not just creating good collegiate players, but good citizens that are going to come out of Vanderbilt to to be a part of our ecosystem, not just in tennis, but in the world. For sure. Now there's a section of tennis that we haven't covered. And I have to admit, I am not well-versed on this, but I am actually, it's kind of something I want to dig into more. Wheelchair tennis. I saw this as an important part of your guys' website. And I wanted to hear about how the wheelchair aspect of tennis is going in the Southern section. Well, I, I, it's so exciting. I will tell you, uh, you know, wheelchair and, and also uh, kids with dis- uh, intellectual disabilities are two areas that we've seen enormous growth, especially here in North Carolina. We just had a CTA form throughout our state that's only about wheelchair tennis, and it goes across the state doing all these clinics. We have the same thing for abilities. I know in Georgia, uh, there's programs for that throughout the South. We've got a program called DreamWorks. Uh, down in Montgomery, Alabama, that works with kids with uh, intellectual disabilities. But wheelchair is just absolutely amazing. There's a program, uh, there's a, a program at the University of Alabama that is a varsity level wheelchair tennis program run by Evan Inquist. And Evan is just a rock star. They have, gosh, I can't remember how many national championships they've won, but they just had a ribbon cutting for a varsity wheelchair facility. Wow. It is a clubhouse and tennis courts just for varsity wheelchair tennis at the University of Alabama. So you might think that Nick Saban is the star at the University of Alabama, but it's really Evan Inquist. I think his record's a little better for national championships than even Nick's. And then in Louisiana, we've got uh, Jennifer Edmondson runs a level one international wheelchair event. And I had the pleasure a few years of going and being a guest there. And to see these players coming from all across the world, these are the same players playing in the U.S. Open, the Australian Open, Wimbledon and the French. And these players are absolutely amazing. Um, Having worked with high performance kids to go out and see the athletic ability that these uh, wheelchair athletes have is absolutely phenomenal. So we're really lucky in the South that we've got some rock stars that are really focusing on bringing that opportunity to their states 
And I think the Southern section has been a leader in that, as, as have several other sections. But the opportunity for these kids to play wheelchair tennis is amazing. Another quick story is there's a boy from North Carolina, Connor Stroud, that was born without legs beneath the knee. And when he was young, he would play in 10 and under tournaments. And my kids played against him. And he was very good, even though he was not able to move that quick. But as he got older, that, that became a little more of a struggle because he couldn't cover the court. And his dad is actually a teaching pro, and they got him involved in wheelchair tennis. And Connor is now playing at the international level at wheelchair tennis. And that's just such an exciting thing to see that we have opportunities for a kid like that that was passionate about tennis, and now he's an international athlete competing in the Olympics and international competitions, still in tennis, but he just gets two bounces. No other rule changes other than one extra bounce. And I've played in a few up-down exhibitions. We do one at our pro tournament in Cary every fall. And to see what these athletes can do is just absolutely amazing. So, Michelle, you definitely need to to learn more about it, get involved. Um, It is just You've got to look at the Cajun Classic in, in, in Louisiana and in Baton Rouge and also check out Evan's program at the University of Alabama. They are just absolutely phenomenal. No, thank you so much. I was taking notes as you were talking. I have some contacts that I need to make and I would love to have them and talk further about it because it's something that's so fascinating and I love seeing it prevalent on a USTA website. Like this is a part of our tennis community Um, because we don't often see that or, you know, and so it was really nice to see that we've seen sometimes, uh, like the U S open, they'll, they'll show a little highlights, but it's, it's fascinating. And it's, it's insane. As you mentioned, these are insane athletes and they're dealing with a challenge and just like, it's very cool. So yes, thank you. I love hearing that. Love it. Okay. So let's take a little peek behind the curtain on like, what you actually do. So <laughs> a lot of times we meet someone in the tennis community and they they say they work for the USTA and we just kind of nod our head and like, mm-hmm, okay, what are some of the things that you actually facilitate in your role? I'm also very passionate about people who are passionate about tennis, being able to find roles and jobs and careers in their life where they can remain involved instead of thinking that like it will not grow with them as they progress in the sport or get older or whatnot. So I think this is a good opportunity for anyone listening that really loves working in tennis. Maybe there's some sort of USTA role that might fit them. And maybe you guys are doing that. So Kelly, let's start with you. What is like a day to day look like? And like, what are some of the, the jobs that you're doing with your role? Yeah. So let me just say that um, leading up to my, my career and my job with USTA, um, I, I really gained a valuable experience through volunteerism, just volunteering, being a part of the USTA committees and Um, annual meetings and meeting people that it really prepared me for the next step, which is um, a Southern employee um, as a TSR. My day-to-day, it's hard to explain day-to-day just because I'm, I have so many different areas that I'm I'm working in. Um, But the one thing that has um, really been busy for me this year is that um, the USTA came out with a new um, online platform um, called Serve Tennis. And um, I've been working with a lot of providers to introduce the platform to them and help with training and just getting everybody on board with the, the, new, um, the new system. So that's taken a, a, a lot of time. Um, and really, I just traveled the state of South Carolina, meet with providers, Um, provide customer service in really any way that that, that they may need. Yeah. And I, I, it's great because I really get to interact with everybody in the tennis community, players, parents, um, you know, call, you know, tennis colleagues. Uh, I play league myself. So I actually, you know, meet a lot of context that way. So um, just really all aspects of tennis, which 
what could be better than a job? Right? <laughs> yeah. You sound like me too. It's like, if Monday looks like Tuesday, then I'm probably not doing it right. I like to hop around from thing to thing and yeah, <laughs> I get it. That sounds awesome. Ted, what about you? What is a day to day or even a weekly kind of job look like? And, uh, what are your favorite parts of the things that you're, you're putting together for the USTA? Yeah, well, you know, it's exciting. I, I have to give a shout out to not only Kelly, but all of our tennis service reps. They just do an amazing job. They're really the ambassadors out there just touching everybody providing tennis. And we're very, very blessed to have great, great TSRs like Kelly out there. It really makes a difference in our section. Um, for me, you know, tennis uh, was not my job originally for the first year or two, but then I ended up uh, getting into teaching and coaching and then kind of left engineering to start companies uh, building, developing, owning, and managing clubs, and also designing facilities. Uh, the facility where we have our pro event, uh, the Cary Tennis Park, I was lucky to uh, manage programs for the town, and they asked me to design a facility, and uh, now it's a 32-court facility where we hold a pro event, the ACC tournament, and I think you know well over 250,000 people a year come through the doors at that public park, so that's really neat that it's a public facility. So uh, in my day job, so to speak, I still have my companies. I pared down a little bit and sold some of the clubs. But one of the projects I was involved in was starting a pro tournament called the Atlantic Tire Championships. And gosh, just so excited. We were just named a special event of the year for USTA North Carolina. But it's a, an ATP event. And uh, we've just had a great time supporting the collegiate teams in our area. And gosh, we've had guys like Francis Tiafo, Riley Opelka, Tennis Sangren, Dennis Kudla, uh, Nakajima. I mean, uh, it's just been amazing to see these guys come through. Sebi Corda's played here, who's doing really well in Paris right now. So, um, you know, that's so much fun. So I still have stayed involved in that and work with that uh, as part of my company. Uh, on the volunteer side, um, it seems like a second job, but uh, it, it's not, it's more of a passion project. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that I've, I've always said is, you know, tennis is the goal, but people the way, you know, people are the reason we start playing and really get into volunteering, just like Kelly, she got into volunteering and that led to a job. And um, tennis has really just meant a lot to my life. My whole family's played now. My boys both have played at a high level, but um, also play other sports, which I think is important. So a day in my life from the tennis standpoint is I chair a national committee. So usually there's several calls there and we're focused on entry level kids play. How do we get kids introduced to the game and get them into competition with junior team tennis that's team play, with junior circuits that are just beginning tournaments that are not super competitive? They're not three days in a row like we all grew up playing. It's, you know, two to three hours to come out and play with people of like abilities, but really to give kids a chance to fall in love with the game before they have to completely dive in a little bit. So our national committee has been really focused on that. That's been fun. At the board level, we're usually meeting monthly, if not more. And uh, gosh, the Southern section just has so many neat things going on. One of our focuses right now coming out of the pandemic, which is perfect, is putting a lot of money into parks programs, trying to find those parks that maybe have courts, but have not had staffing. They don't have instructors. They've not really gone all in because they're running all these different programs. But with the USTA resources, we can provide uh, training, we can provide equipment, we can provide programs. And the other thing that we've actually done is put our money where our, our mouth is a little bit. And the next year, we're going to spend somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 to go out with Kelly and the TSR's help and identify these parks that would like to hold tennis, but just aren't really sure how to do it. Do they need some consulting? Do they need some training? Do they need new nets? Do they need instructors and do whatever we can? Because really, that's where tennis grows is at the grassroots level with people that get passionate about it. So, you know, that's what makes my day to day part of volunteering a lot of fun. But the key is really the people getting to work with people like Kelly, uh, John Callen, who's our executive director, is retiring uh, in January after 30 some years. He has been our executive director known throughout the country. He's a leader. And so I've been volunteering for about 30 of John's years back when I was in my early mid twenties as a coach. And so I've been able to go all through the pathway and volunteer in different ways. So as you said, 
if you're doing the same thing twice, you might be getting bored. I've gone from a high performance coach now to worrying about how we get kids in the game and then building clubs. I was worried about creating two, five ladies teams and varsity players. So, um, you know, tennis just has so many different pieces of the puzzle, but really the key to me is once I got started volunteering, it's the people I've got family all over the nation. Now, what I call my tennis family, I can almost not go through an airport without running into somebody that I know uh, because of tennis. So the USTA has, has provided that opportunity but tennis is that vehicle that's done it. And you just meet the nicest people in tennis. Nice. I love that. I had, I was going to ask you guys what separates the Southern section from other sections, but like I haven't talked to other representatives of other sections recently, but it seems like you're doing a lot and you're working really hard to grow the sport. And it's so nice to hear that. We've been really lucky. We just have so many great volunteers. And, and again, I think, uh, you know, having people like Kelly out there in the field and, and working with providers. So Kelly can talk more about that. But what what they do on a day to day basis really is making a, a making just such a difference in the lives of so many people, getting them involved in tennis and giving them a place that they feel like they belong. Yeah. And another way that I think so, the southern section is different um, is that the financial support that um, that's given to the, the community um, and the states through various program grants um, that Southern offers. Nice. Well, it's so nice to hear all the stuff that you're building. You're building this like great infrastructure to really bring people in. And it like you kids keep keen in on, which I think is so important is we're trying to make tennis fun. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be your life. It doesn't have to be your profession. It doesn't have to be your career as far as like being a college player or a professional player. Like it can be a fun hobby. (laughs) It can be a fun way to connect with friends. It can be a social hour. It can be a good exercise. It can be all these things and it doesn't have to be so serious. Well, you hear so many great stories too, of people that have played tennis and then maybe their career takes them all over the country. And what I hear time after time is when they moved into that new community, what they did is they went and found out where leagues start. And that's how they've kind of gotten indoctrinated into that community. That's how they've met friends. That's been their circle of influence as they've started with tennis. So we all tend to do that with careers, but gosh, tennis can be so much fun. It's, you know, how many sports, like I I played baseball, basketball, and football growing up, baseball in college. I don't go get nine guys and go play baseball on Saturday afternoon, (laughs) but I can grab some buddies and go out and play doubles. And afterwards we might have a beverage or two. We might go get a pizza. And so it just really lends itself And, you know, there's a study that came out from uh, England that said that tennis adds years to your life. I think it was eight or nine years to your life compared to all these other sports because of not only the cardiovascular and the health benefits, but the mental benefits. You stay engaged. You're not just out there, you know, thumping a ball around. You're actually looking at what angles are on the court and the height of the ball and the trajectory and how you need to move with your partner and that social component as well as the mental component. So when you combine the physical, the mental, and the social, there are just not many sports out there that you can play. And there's national championships into the 80s and 90s. And uh, a good friend of ours from North Carolina, I remember when she won a gold ball in the 85 and overs. And I was like 28 years old going, my God, people can still walk. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Well, now I'm getting old, so I think that's amazing. But to have it be a lifetime sport, and to have all three of those components and add years to your life. It's just hard to find anything that'd be better. Yes. Agreed. I am. My goal is to get the gold ball on the second half of my life. Cause I didn't get it on the first half, but we're going to get there. <laughs> those people are inspirational for me too. And of course, I hope that I'm playing tennis well through my eighties. I mean, you're right. Such a great sport. And especially through the pandemic, it's such a great way to connect with people, which is like something that was missing for so many. And it's so, it's so fun. Even if you don't even know the person you're going to go play with, it's just you, it's an easy conversation starter. Hey, let's play tennis. Cool. And then you, you have a new friend. (laughs) Yeah. I just wanted to circle back on the community um, family that you create in, in your tennis, um, your tennis world. I've seen communities come together to support other people in need in huge amounts. You know, a Teaching Crow's daughter is uh, battling cancer right now and the community comes together. Um, and I've seen it happen over and over. And um, that's what 
the thing that I'm most proud about the tennis community is they're always there when you need them. Nothing against SoCal or NorCal tennis. <laughs> we're great. I actually, in San Luis Obispo, California, we're kind of in this little section of California that's not super populated. So my colleagues out in Alpharetta, Georgia, I am constantly telling them like, okay, I'm really jealous of your USTA community because like they're telling me how they're playing like three to four league matches. They have mixed leagues. They have the, like doubles only. And I'm like, that's the one thing I'm super jealous of. And it, it sounds like there's good reason why they all love being on so many leagues, like the community involvement. And it, it's just, it, you guys, you're giving me the good feels today. This is great. I love it. <laughs> are you noticing any trends on the court, whether it's with juniors or adults, or are there constant trends through the age groups or something specific you're seeing in a certain age group or anything that's trending out on the court at the moment? So I think the biggest thing right now is the trend of the new players coming into the game. I mean, both, you know, at the junior level, all the way up to, to any age. Um, and again, the response that USTA has had to create the programming to keep those and get those new people into the game. I think that's right now our, our biggest trend. And then the trend of really working with the Parks and Rec um, to get more tennis played on the courts in their communities. Nice. And with the two U.S. Open finalists on the women's side being under, like in their teens, under 20, are you seeing kind of like the juniors like, okay, I can, I can be there too. And I think it's amazing to, you know, to see one, especially that was a qualifier that wasn't even the main draw that's coming through. Uh, just phenomenal. And, you know, it's such a great time. We've, we've heard about, you know, when's the next Pete Sampras Andre Agassi, Andy Roddick, when are we going to have another Grand Slam champ? Well, I think we have, gosh, 13 or 14 men now in the top 100. And I think all but two of those we've had come through our Challenger event. So it's nice to see that there is a progression that they're just not appearing out of the woodwork. So that, you know, what, what we're trying to do in this country to promote the game, you know, one of the best ways to get more good players is just to have more players try the game. And I think the more popular we can make the sport, and that's why entry level is really so important. But then on the women's side, I mean, the U.S. with Serena and Venus, Jennifer Brady, all, and on and on. I mean, they've been dominating here for four or five years. So I think we're starting to see that maybe in the pro game a little bit. And it's just amazing to see how many players – are making it into that top 100 where they can make a living and they're on TV. And uh, I think the more role models, you know, to see Venus and Serena, to see Jim Brady, who went to college and played, John Isner from North Carolina, who went and played at Georgia and then had a wonderful career after going to college. You know, that's so much different than when I was first doing high performance coaching and every good kid I had when they were, you know, top 10 in the country or the world, you know, everybody's talking to them about turning pro. Well, college at the varsity level has gotten so strong. It's such a viable option now. And I just feel like that's so much better. Now having kids, I can't imagine my kids at 16, 17, getting on the road and traveling, playing pro tennis and not getting that education and maturing. I think other countries over maybe in Europe, they do travel and get that experience. But I feel like we, we value education so much more. But to let kids have the opportunity to have that education to fall back on, but that doesn't mean they can't play pro tennis, that it can be aspirational as well as educational. So um, I think that's a new trend that we're seeing more players coming. Jim Brady, I think, was at UCLA for a year or two. We've had others. Danielle Collins played at UVA, you know, on and on. So we used not to see that on the women's side. It was only on the men's. But now we're seeing it on the men's and the women's. And it just it means that there's a different track for everybody. But I think a really awesome trend is to see more kids knowing they can go to college, get an education, and then still have a chance to play pro tennis. And God gracious, you got Roger Federer playing as old as he is. I mean, <laughs> that's amazing to see those people that are still competitive. So that means you can come out at 22, 23 and still have a career into your late 30s. So that didn't exist. Usually by 30, you were burnt out. So I think that's a wonderful trend, at least in the U.S. for us culturally to see that we can value that educational component, but still go out and know that you've got a chance to play on the Pro Tour if that's what your passion is. 
Yeah, I would have to agree. And I also would add on to it that I've, what I've noticed just speaking with some of these players is they learn how to be a teammate and play on a team and have support from another competitor almost. And once they're on the pro tour, they translate that team in like vibe into their, the way they travel, the way they play. There's this whole crew specifically on the women's side. I've noticed it with of American players that all played college tennis. Some were teammates, some were rivals, but now they travel together or they play doubles with the other one and they, they practice together. And it's such a cool thing to see because I feel like 20 years ago, it was very like cutthroat and like, you know, but now all of a sudden this team feel is translating and they're traveling as pro players with this little group of friends and they have their resources. And I don't know, I just love that too. That's great. And I think you're seeing, you know, we never saw that on the men's side, but really the group that have come through together now with Taylor Fritz, Mm -hmm. Raleigh Opelka and Tommy Paul. You know, Tommy grew up in North Carolina, but Tommy and Riley were living together down in Florida during the pandemic. They're best buds. Taylor's a really close friend. I think Riley was his best man in his wedding. And so those three guys were swapping off winning junior Grand Slam events, <laughs> but yet being competitors. And mm-hmm. I think because they were traveling maybe with Jay Berger and USTA coaches, they had a little bit of that. So we never used to see that on the men's side, right. but now that is happening. And that's what we used to hear about the Spanish Armada all those guys that grew up together with Nadal and all, and they all like helped each other get better. Well, you know, gosh, Taylor's having a great week in Paris right now. Riley, who played our tournament, man, he's just come, come and jumped. And then I think Tommy is another example. You know, Tommy did not go to college. He was supposed to go to the university of Georgia, did well in a pro event in Atlanta, decided to turn pro, but it took Tommy two or three years to get that professionalism. And if you talk to him today, he'd say, yeah, he, he probably could have used a year or two of being part of a team, having to get along with the other guys, learning what work ethic was. And now all the colleges have the nutrition, Mm -hmm. the trainers, the strength training, the physios, as well as you learn how to play. And so um, I think you're right. And gosh, the girls in in the U.S., I mean, what what a great story that is. And to see them getting along and (laughs) fighting together. You know, you go to the open and they're on the practice courts together. And that's an awesome thing to see because, you know, that rising tide lifts all ships. And I think that's something that we hope continues for American tennis. Awesome. Well, you guys gave such a great representation of your section and it like makes me, it kind of makes me feel reinvigorated um, to like do good on my end. Also, I guess it's the time of year. It's kind of like, you know, that November give back kind of vibe, but now I've like got all these thoughts in my head. I used to love working NJTL events and I used to have a whole little NJTL set up down in, um, out in the desert, actually, we're kind of beyond where they do BMP and Indio, but um, I'm thinking I need might need to pull together something for the holidays and give back a little bit myself. So I feel like this, this conversation tugged at my heartstrings a little bit, and it's so nice to hear what you guys are doing, what your section's doing, and how you're promoting our sport and keeping it growing and thriving. So awesome. Well, th- thanks for having us. Uh, thanks to Kelly for all she's doing. And thanks to to you and Tennis Warehouse for the support. But uh, it's great that you're promoting the sport through what you're doing with your podcast. And if you uh, if you need a little part-time home, we can find you somewhere in the Southern section. To come, by, <laughs> come visit. Awesome. Sure. Um, also, can you tell people how they can get involved with the Southern section, check out what's going on and plug any links or social channels that you guys have? So they can always visit usta.com and um, they would be directed to the Southern Section website um, where there's a wealth of um, information out there, um, contact information for any one of us. Yeah, I think the website's a great way. And then socially, you know, check us out. You can check out USTA Southern. You can just do a quick search on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. And then um, all of our nine Southern states also have uh, you know, social channels as well. But I would say those are the main ones that you're seeing. And, uh, you know, we'd love for people to connect with us and especially people that are maybe moving into the section that are looking how to get involved. And like we said, every one of our nine states has a state office as well. So you've got a USCA South Carolina where, where Kelly's located. But uh, as part of that Southern section, it will actually help link you to what the local offices. And then we have community tennis associations 
throughout the local communities too. So between the CTAs, the state offices and the section office, there's just a wealth of information out there and all those social channels as well as the website. And we'd love to uh, to provide that information to anybody. So I'd say that the, the web and social would be great links and we'd love to get them involved in programs at whatever level they would like to. Yes. And I have to give a shout out to your section. You guys also have Talking Tennis Southern Style podcast, which is so cool. I don't know if other USTA sections have a podcast, but I was guest starring on an episode and they were awesome. And I've listened to a bunch of them, really cool content coming out of the podcast about what the section's doing. So that might be a fun way to keep up with everything and try to keep up with all the things going on in the Southern section. And we can post the link for all of those, the USTA site, the social links and the podcast in the show notes for this episode. So if anyone's looking for that, it will be easy for them to find it. And speaking of a podcast, uh, one of my colleagues, the Georgia TSR, uh, Claire Bartlett has her own podcast called Me and My Racket. So um, check that out sometime. It's a yes. very interesting little podcast that she's put together over the last year. Awesome. I love that. And then it looks like I'm going to have to connect with some people on wheelchair tennis and get an episode going. So we're just continuing to create and grow some passion on tennis. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, I hope you will re- reach out. Be glad to connect you with Evan and Jennifer. And, you know, awesome. again, thanks for thanks for being a guest on our, our podcast, too, because <laughs> that's awesome that you're willing to do that. And you know, that has been such a nice vehicle. And I think what you're doing is the same thing. So anything we can all do to let people know how great tennis is, uh, it's just going to help, uh, help us all be uh, healthier and, and have more fun. Awesome. I love it. Thank you guys so much for joining me. And we always end each episode, say happy hitting. Thank you. Happy hitting to you too. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) 